Now that we've had an overview of non-Christian approaches to ethics, let's see how a Christian view of ethics would have a foundation. First, we need to see what our foundation is. After all, we saw that Howard Gardner has no foundation for his ethical principles. So what's our foundation? As Christians, we base our ethical decisions on God's Word. So let's look at that. The Word of God our foundation for ethics is necessary for ethics and it's sufficient for ethics. That is, we can't make proper ethical decisions without scripture, it's necessary, and we don't need anything in addition to God's word to decide right and wrong. It's sufficient. So, how is the Bible necessary? Well, think about Romans 1, 19-32. This passage, if you could read that on your own, deals with the, what theologians call natural revelation. It's God's revelation of himself in creation. Paul says that what may be known about God is plainly revealed in nature. He says, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things they are made, so that are, they are without excuse. But think about what man does with this knowledge. He turns away from God and worships idols. He turns to homosexuality. He turns to all kinds of wickedness, including sexual immorality, murder, disobedience, backbiting. So it's obvious that man cannot act in an ethically good way just by considering natural revelation. So we can't rely on natural revelation alone. And second, the Bible is necessary not just because men are sinful due to the fall. I mean, think about Adam. Even Adam, before he sinned, needed a specific revelation from God. God had to tell Adam and Eve what their calling was to exercise dominion. He had to tell them to be fruitful and multiply. He had to tell them which fruit was good and which was to be avoided. Adam and Eve would not have known these things unless God had told them. Think, too, about how Adam and Eve were supposed to follow God's word in their ethical decision-making. Think about the sin of Eve. Think about what happened. She had the word of God already. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan came along and asked her about that, planting doubts in her mind. You know, maybe God is unjust, not letting you eat from any tree. Eve repeated what God said, but may have been giving in to doubts. After all, she added that God said they couldn't even touch that tree. God never said that. So Satan then just blatantly contradicted God, saying they would become like God, knowing good and evil. Now, what did that mean, knowing good and evil? What well, didn't mean knowing what was good and what was evil, since Adam and Eve already knew that. The Hebrew word for know here can refer to intimate knowledge. I mean, later it says that Adam knew Eve. It can also mean deciding something. And that's what's going on here. Satan wanted Adam and Eve to know good and evil the way God knows good and evil. He doesn't look outside of himself at some standard of right and wrong, some list of laws, and decide what's right and wrong. God himself determines what's good and evil. So Satan was tempting Eve to do the same thing, to decide for herself what was right and wrong. So what did she do? She didn't just submit to God and follow him without question. Neither did she submit to Satan and follow him. Instead, she took a neutral approach. She took God's hypothesis about the tree and Satan's hypothesis and said, well, I guess I'll have to figure this one out myself. Who's right, God or the serpent? So she stood back, looked at the tree for herself, and decided for herself that eating it was good. Instead of following God's word and submitting to it, she became her own lawmaker. And people do the same thing today. I mean, Howard Gardner is just one example. Instead of taking God's word as truth, they try to find out for themselves what's good and bad. But it can't be done. God's word is necessary for ethics. But not only is God's word necessary, it's sufficient for ethics. It's all we need. Look at 2 Timothy 3, 
16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Notice, thoroughly equipped for every good work. If we need to know what the good thing to do is, in any case, we need to study scripture and we don't need anything else to equip us for good works. We don't need Howard Gardner's surveys. We don't need some mystic crystal revelation. We just need scripture. Now we'll see later what this involves and how we apply scripture to our Christian life. But The foundation is that we must have scripture as God's word and we don't need anything else in addition to it. One theologian has put it this way. The Bible contains all God's words that we need to live pleasing to Him. That doesn't mean that we don't learn from other things. You learned much in your education courses that's been helpful to you. When you go to select which cut of meat you're going to buy for supper, you use financial considerations, your own tastes, your available time to prepare it, and so on. There's much that we need to live that isn't found in Scripture. It's just that the Bible has all the Word of God that we need to live a godly life. Now what about the idea that God spoke to me and told me something? When I want to know what to do, maybe I wait for God to tell me. Now Christians differ on whether this still happens, but I think there are some areas where all Christians would agree. First, we all agree God uses the Holy Spirit to enlighten us as to what His Word means and how it applies to us. We all know of times in our own lives when we look at a passage of Scripture and all of a sudden God opens our eyes to some specific meaning or application to our lives. That's the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and it's absolutely necessary. We cannot understand or apply Scripture properly unless the Spirit opens our minds and hearts to do so. I think this is what is actually happening when we usually say, God told me to do something. It's God working in our hearts and our conscience, using Scripture to lead us to do what is right in His sight. Second, we all agree that if God speaks to His people today, He doesn't contradict what Scripture teaches. You can't say, God told me to commit adultery with my neighbor's wife, or God told me to murder my principal. If God does speak to people, it's going to be something in agreement with Scripture, or he would be contradicting himself. Generally, when people say this, it's in situations that are not addressed explicitly in Scripture. Sometimes it's something like, God told me to marry Jane instead of Sue, when both Jane and Sue are believers. Or it's like, God told me I shouldn't buy that lottery ticket. Now, let me give you my view here, and I base this on this excellent book I can recommend for you, Gary Friesen's book, Decision Making and the Will of God. I think scripture tells us all we need to know to live a godly life, but it does this by giving us boundaries and direction. It tells us, love God with all your heart. It tells us, don't worship other gods. But it doesn't tell us what hymns to sing on Sunday morning, or even what style of music to use in church. God leaves that up to us and to sanctified common sense. The Bible tells us marry in the Lord, but it doesn't tell us whether I should marry Jane or Sue if they're both believers. I could marry either one of them, and either one would be right. I don't expect God to give me some word about which one to marry. He leaves that up to me. As long as I stay within his boundaries, I'm doing right. Now, I think that's what's taught by Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. You see, we live by what God has told us in his word, what he has revealed. The secret things, his secret plan for my life, that's hidden. God doesn't call on me to try to figure that out. That belongs to God alone. I'm responsible to do what his word tells me, not to try to pry into his secret will. Now here's an illustration. 
Many Christians see God's will as a bullseye on a target. That bullseye is God's perfect will for my life. And my goal is to try to hit that bullseye. I've got to discern precisely what God wants me to do through a study of Scripture, to be sure, but also through figuring out how the Spirit is leading me or listening to a still, small voice of God. Whom should I marry? What job should I take? What house should we buy? What car should we buy? Where should I go to the store today? Now, many Christians follow this approach but tend to limit it to the big decisions of life, like marriage and a job. But why should you limit it to those big decisions? Should you wait for God to lead you, whether to take I-75 through town or take the perimeter? Why not seek to discern God's will for whether you should buy Del Monte or Kroger brand canned corn? Should you try to discern whether it's God's perfect will for you to go to work tomorrow? You can see how, and I've experienced this with seeing this in others, how this can quickly become paralyzing. If I don't know whether God wants me to buy Del Monte or Kroger corn, I might just stand there in the grocery aisle waiting for the Spirit to tell me. Then I go down the aisle and have to wait again for God to tell me which package of ground beef and which brand of toilet paper. See, that's one reason I don't think this is the right way to think about determining the will of God. This quickly degenerates into paralysis unless we limit it to the big things in life. But then we're implying that God is only concerned about those big things and not the little things. I think another approach will give us a better understanding. This is the boundary view. Okay. Scripture tells us boundaries. Don't do this do that. It's like a playground. It sets out the fence for the playground. Everything within that fence, within those boundaries, is in the will of God for me. Everything outside that fence is outside God's will. As long as I stay in the playground, in the boundaries, I'm confident that I'm within God's will. Now that boundary might be big or little depending on the issue. Buying canned corn, there's a lot of choices. Any of them are within God's will. Still considering other issues like a wise stewardship of resources so you're not spending beyond your means, that type of thing. But there are many choices and I won't go wrong with any of them. That's where other things come into play. Maybe I like the taste of Del Monte better than Kroger so I get Del Monte. Now that's actually God directing me providentially, but we'll talk about that later. That has a big boundary. Some other issues might have very tight boundaries. Should I embezzle from my employer or not? There's a real small playground on that one, not many options. Should I marry Jane or Sue, who are believers, or Mary, who is not? Well, Scripture rules out Mary. But if Jane and Sue are both believers, and both will be good helpers for me, then I can go with which one is better looking, or which one has more money, or which one will actually be willing to marry me. I'm inside the boundaries laid out in Scripture, so I can be confident that I will be in the will of God. I don't need to try to figure out which one is in God's secret will for me. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says that's God's business, not mine. You see, this is a very liberating perspective. It drives us, though, all the more to the Word of God. We need to make sure we define those boundaries the way God does in Scripture, all of Scripture. Now, I've talked about this a while, but I don't actually think this is a big issue among Christians. If you believe God told you specifically to marry your wife, I don't think you're a heretic unless she was a non-Christian when God told you to marry her. Now, that would contradict Scripture. We'll be talking more about this, especially the role of the Holy Spirit, when we talk about the heart. But here's a few further thoughts on this topic. First, God often guides us through his providence, the way he governs our lives. We see this in the book of Acts, for example. As Paul was going on a missionary journey, it said that he was going in one direction and God closed a door. And then he went another direction, God kept him from going that way, until he ended up going to Macedonia. God providentially led him to go to Macedonia, just through different things, different situations that came up. And God does the same for us. So I'm trying to decide whether to marry Jane or Sue. And 
then Jane moves across the country and gets engaged to some freak hippie in California. So God closed that door for me. So Sue is left. Or I go to the store to buy Del Monte corn on sale, but it's all sold out, so I buy Kroger corn. God has ordered these situations in my life to lead me to make certain decisions. I put this in a different category than saying God told me to buy Kroger corn because that seems to imply additional revelation outside of Scripture. But God often providentially directs my steps. That doesn't always happen. Maybe there's still green giant corn with the Kroger corn. But that's one way God guides us in our decisions. For example, when I was looking for a job several years back, I put out a lot of applications, different Christian schools and some college teaching jobs as well. Some of them just didn't work out. Nothing came of them or it just didn't work out. It came down to two real options that I had. And so that was where it was just a matter of my wife and I deciding, okay, which one was more appealing to us. But now second, don't forget the role of prayer in all of this. As we pray and ask for wisdom, which God has promised to give us, God may open up our minds to consider other factors that make our decision more clear. You know, maybe we begin to see something in Jane's life that makes her less suitable for marriage than Sue. Or maybe, in response to prayer, God just causes our heart to be drawn more to Sue than to Jane. Again, I'm hesitant to refer to that as God told me because I think that can lead to an idea of continuing a revelation. But if the choices are equally scriptural, then I have no problem with making the decision that your heart leads to or that seems more attractive to you emotionally. After all, we're told in the Bible that God turns the king's heart to do his will. So he can turn your heart to desire those things that will carry out his secret will. But there's still going to be times you don't feel those urgings, these leadings. Don't wait for God to give you revelation, but make your choices based on the wisdom you have at the time. Now, I don't think this is a matter of heresy, as long as you keep these things in mind. First, God does not contradict Scripture. If you believe God's leading you to do something that's contrary to Scripture, that is heresy. Notice Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 3, where he talks about if there's a prophet who comes and he gives a sign or wonder, and even if that comes to pass, but if he's saying, let's go after other gods, which is a contradiction of Scripture, then he says, that's a false prophet. So we test things by Scripture, by prior revelation. Second, if you want to say God told me something, as long as you don't believe that's infallible revelation, I'm not going to fuss with you about it. I think that if God tells you something, it won't be wrong. But if you say, God told me I should pray for you today, that's good. If you say, God told me I should leave earlier for work, and sure enough, there was a wreck on the way, well, that's fine. Just realize that you might believe, God told me I should leave earlier for work today, and it just means you get to work early, nothing else. The only time I think we should reconsider that language is if it contradicts Scripture, or if we start implying that it's infallible revelation. Now, as we use Scripture, there are two key things we need to consider. First, we have to interpret Scripture properly. We've all heard people prove just about anything they want to prove by twisting Scripture. One of my favorites in a school setting is a story about a student who was caught cheating on a test by looking on another student's work. And he said, well, I was just doing what the Bible says. Paul says in Philippians 2, 4, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now, we have to interpret the Bible correctly. I don't have time here to go through an entire course in hermeneutics. That's the rule for interpretation of Scripture. But here's three things we need to keep in mind. First, we need to use what's called grammatical historical interpretation. That is, we study the words and grammar of the text itself and study those in the context of the times they were written. It's kind of like a strict constructionist view of the U.S. Constitution. What did the Founding Fathers mean by what they wrote? Not what would we like it to mean. It's the same thing with the Bible. What did Isaiah mean by his writings? What was Paul intending when he wrote? 
what would their hearers have understood? We can't import 21st century meanings back into the words of the Bible. We have to think about what they meant for them. For example, I've heard people interpret the book of Revelation as referring to modern things like helicopters. They read about locusts. John or his hearers would not have thought about helicopters. The book would have been utter nonsense to them if that's what was meant. No, we need to ask, what did John mean by his language, and what would his hearers have understood? Second, Scripture interprets Scripture. That is, one passage of the Bible cannot contradict another passage, since it's all God's Word and God isn't going to contradict himself. When we come to a difficult part in the Bible, we look at the rest of the Bible to help us understand it. And we don't just pull isolated verses out of their context. We read each verse in the light of the whole Bible. Third, we have to see that Christ is the focus of the entire Bible. It's all about him. When Jesus talked with the disciples after his resurrection on the road to Emmaus, he began with Moses and showed them all the things that referred to himself. We have to see how the Bible re reveals Christ to us. In the area of eth ethics especially, this is important, because we can easily fall into the trap of moralism, reading the Bible as if it's just a list of rules, a list of do's and don'ts to follow. When we teach small children, it's easy to, to fall into this. We tell boys and girls to be good. We tell them Bible stories to get them to be good. Now, the Bible does tell us how to be good. But the only way we can really be good is for Christ to transform our life. In our ethical studies, we can't forget that Christ is the only one who ever lived a perfect ethical life. Now, if you want to do a lot of deep reading, there's an excellent book on this topic. Vern Poythress's The Shadow of Christ in the Law of Moses. He shows in great detail how we need to see Christ revealed in the Old Testament, particularly in the Law of Moses. Now the other consideration as we use the Bible is that it has to be applied to our lives, to our circumstances. You're going to find very few Bible verses which explicitly speak of situations you face. If you want to know whether it's okay to go 75 on I-75, don't bother looking in the concordance for the word interstate. It's not going to get you very far. If you want to know whether pornography is good or bad, you're not going to find a Bible verse that has the word pornography in it. If you want to know whether human cloning is good, it's not explicitly in the Bible. Now, this does not contradict our statement that the Bible is sufficient for every good work. It just means we have to find how the Bible applies. Scripture itself gives us direction here. Consider the Ten Commandments. What does it mean, you shall not murder? Does that forbid killing in war? Does it forbid abortion? Does it forbid capital punishment? Does it forbid killing in self-defense? In much of the rest of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are what is called case laws. That is, they basically say, in this case, here's what you do. The case laws show us examples, they're not exhaustive, but examples of how God applies the Ten Commandments. For example, Exodus 22, 2-3 says, If the thief is found breaking in, and he is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. If the sun is risen upon him, there shall be guilt for his bloodshed. So what this means is that if someone's breaking into my house, I'm justified if I shoot him. That's a further level of application since the case law talk, talks about striking him. But I'm justified if I kill him in the act. There's no guilt on my part. But if he breaks in and escapes, and I know who it is, I can't go chase him down and kill him. That's no longer self-defense, but vengeance. So this is one example of how God applies the law to specific cases. We need to do the same thing. We look at all of Scripture, see what the principles of the situation are, and which biblical teachings apply to those underlying principles. This can also be called casuistry, which just simply means applying Scripture to individual cases. That's where casuistry comes from.
Since the Bible doesn't explicitly address many situations we face, we must determine how to apply the Bible to those cases. As we do this, we have to avoid two abuses of casuistry which have occurred throughout history. First, we have to avoid using casuistry to be overly lax in our applications by trying to find loopholes in the law to excuse sin. For example, think about the Sabbath commandment, the fourth commandment, which says, I am not to work, nor my son, my daughter, my manservant, nor my maidservant. You know what? The fourth commandment doesn't say anything about prohibiting my wife from working. So, I find the loophole and force my wife to work on Sunday. Now, we know that that's not valid, but that's uh, trying to find a loophole in the law through casuistry. So we have to be careful that we don't excuse sin through our arguments. But we also have to avoid excessive regulations like the Pharisees did. For example, in order to avoid violating the prohibition against boiling a young kid in, in its mother's milk, that's in Exodus 23, the Pharisees forbade people from eating milk and dairy products at the same meal. They fenced the law. To try to keep people from breaking the law, they came up with rules to prevent people from doing anything close to breaking the law. I mean, I've heard about situations today where in predominantly Jewish areas with high-rise skyscrapers, uh, elevators are programmed to automatically stop on every floor on the Sabbath day so that the Orthodox Jews don't have to push a button which they would consider doing work. Now, sometimes this fencing of the law is helpful. For example, the Bible prohibits lustful thoughts. So I can say that you should not go into a store where pornography is displayed openly and blatantly. I mean, that's a rule that goes beyond the Bible, but the idea is to help keep the laws of the Bible. But I can't, I can't treat my rules the same as God's law. You see, God could call someone to witness to the owners of that porn shop, and he'd have to go into the store to do it. So I can't treat my law as equal to God's law. He's not breaking God's law as long as he doesn't engage in lust. Another example would be many of our Sabbath guidelines. For example, when my children were young, we wouldn't allow them to watch TV on Sundays until after evening worship. It wasn't because TV was evil, but that was just a helpful way for us to keep our minds focused on the Lord for the day. If others watch TV on Sunday, that's not a violation of the fourth commandment. The error here would be if we made our rule equivalent to God's word. So when we apply scripture, we have to avoid both of these errors of casuistry. This is where the biblical concept of wisdom comes in. Proverbs gives us many cases, many situations, many observations, and the wise man is the one who can see a given situation and understand it properly in the light of Scripture. Hebrews 5, 13 and 14 says, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled at the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Wisdom is skill in using the word of righteousness, Scripture. It's not divorced from the Bible, but it's proper use of the Bible. But that wisdom isn't something that comes instantly. It comes to those who are adults spiritually, those who have experience in living the Christian life, in dealing with life's problems, in studying the Bible, in hearing the faithful preaching of the Word, in interacting with God's people. These are ways the Lord helps us to develop wisdom. The idea is that we grow in our ability to face a situation and know how the Bible should apply to that situation. So we'll get to that more in a future lesson. So now, to summarize, what we've seen so far, it's important for Christians to study ethics. There are non-Christian approaches to ethics, of which we must be aware. The Bible, the Word of God, is necessary for ethics, and it is sufficient for ethics. And we have to use proper methods to interpret and apply the Bible. Now, after you finish this video, there's a question on the discussion board. 
something to help you think through what we've been talking about. So jot down your thoughts on that discussion board before we go on.